The Kuti Sichais, Chelik Chav, Volume 20, the third Sicha Paparshus Vayetze. This Sicha will explain how the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the entire creation and all the Goyim that are in this world is for the purpose of assisting us, B'nai Yisrael, in fulfilling our Torah and mitzvahs. And how through this they become all blessed, that is, the creation and all the nations of the world. We will skip chapter 7, 8, and 9. I would recommend that you look inside the Sicha to study it thoroughly. The verses, the Psukim, that are applicable to this Sicha is in chapter 30, from verse 27 through 30. There, Lavan tells Yaakov how he was blessed. He, Lavan, is blessed because of him, because of Yaakov. And later Yaakov confirms it by saying that Hashem blessed you because of me. Now, just as an introduction to familiarize ourselves with some concepts that will be mentioned in the Sicha, there's something called Machshire Mitzvah, meaning things that are not the actual, that are not necessary for the actual performance of the mitzvah itself directly, but rather they are, so to speak, preps for the performance of the mitzvah. For example, we know that Mila doicha es hashabbos. You know, when a child is born, if you have to, you have to perform the bris on the eighth day. If the eighth day falls out on Shabbos, then even though it's a surgery, even though you're using a knife to cut skin to cut flesh, but you're allowed to do it on Shabbos. However, there's a machlekes, there's a debate in the Sechah Shabbos whether the things that are needed in order to prepare the tools or the items for the bris milah, if that also is allowed to be performed on Shabbos. For example, to sharpen the knife, to sharpen the blade, or to prepare coals in order to warm water, that you need to have hot water for a compress for the, for the, for the, after the milah. So there's one opinion that holds that since this contributes to the mitzvah, then it's doiches a Shabbos. It pushes away Shabbos, and you're allowed to do it on Shabbos. However, the halacha is that no, Machshiri mitzvah, anything that can be done in advance, even though, yes, it is necessary for the mitzvah, you cannot do the, you cannot perform the bris milah, for example, without a sharp blade, but still, since that can be done in advance, it is not doich Shabbos, you're not allowed to do it on Shabbos. Another concept, we know that a male, a man, is commanded, has a obligation to perform the mitzvah of purvu to be fruitful and multiply, to have children. However, a woman is not obligated minatera, to have children. But we understand that it's impossible to have children without a woman. And the question is, does she have part of the mitzvah or not? In other words, the fact that she assists in the mitzvah, and she's a crucial part of the mitzvah, even though she doesn't have an obligation, is she also considered to be part of this mitzvah? Does she receive the reward of the mitzvah of approval? Let's get into the sikha. So, in connection to the blessing that occurred in the sheep of Lavan, which came in the merit of Yaakov, the Zohar brings two opinions. There's a debate exactly to what degree was the blessing. The first opinion is, quote, Lavan Ashka, he found in the merit of Yaakov an excess of a hundred sheep, a hundred lambs, and a hundred goats, every month more than he would have normally in his flock. That's the first opinion. The second opinion is the opinion of Rabbi Abba that says, no, a thousand sheep and a thousand lambs and a thousand goats more, Yaakov, notice the words, Yaakov would bring to him uh, in, in the extra every single month. And he brings actually proof for this when Yaakov said to Lavan in verse 30, Vayivorech Hashem oischa liragli that Hashem blessed you because of me. And Rabbi Abba concludes in the second opinion that the blessing that comes from above, that comes from Hashem, always is not less than a thousand. Now we understand that even according to the first opinion, it doesn't argue with the fact that a blessing that comes from above is a thousand. Everybody agrees with that, right? And also everybody agrees that the blessing that Laban received in the words of Laban himself, in verse 27, was because of Yaakov, and it came from Hashem. 
So what is exactly the point of the machlekes? What is the point of the debate? What is the reason for the difference of opinion? The answer is because there's two ways that a blessing of Hashem could manifest itself and come down here in the, in the reality of this world. There's a manner, there's one way, where it comes down in such a manner that even when it comes down, it's clear and evident, it's obvious that it's a godly blessing. And therefore it's a thousand. However, there's another way that a blessing can manifest itself. And that is when it comes down to this world, as it evolves into the reality of nature, it's not so noticeable, it's not so obvious, it's not evident that that blessing is a blessing from above. And therefore, it comes now into the realm of nature, as we'll see. And therefore, it is limited to only a hundred times over. But we need to understand, this doesn't clarify the matter. Because also, according to the first opinion, where did this blessing come from? It came from Hashem. So why would we say that the blessing, when it came down here, a blessing that clearly Lavan admitted and said that it came from Hashem, why would we say, in other words, he recognized that it came from Hashem, why would we say that it changed from a thousand to a hundred? Another thing we also need to understand. If you look carefully, you look closely, Rabbi Abba, that's the second opinion, that it was a thousand, he brings his proof from verse 30, that he says there, Vayivorech Hashem oischa liragli, that Hashem blessed me, blessed you because of me, in Yaakov's words. Why does he specifically bring it from this verse? In other words, why is this a specific proof to his opinion? That's the first question. The second question is, why the difference in the wording of how the blessing came? In the first opinion it says, Lavan, quote, found, that means Lavan was the one who encountered this extra blessing of a hundred times over. Whereas, in other words, the emphasis is on what Lavan found, what Lavan received. Whereas in the second blessing, in contrast, the emphasis is that Yaakov was the one who presented, who brought the blessing to him. He brought the extra sheep. So the Rebbe says the point of explanation is as follows. We know that what is the idea of a bracha? What does it mean when there's a blessing? A blessing means that you draw down, you channel a hashpa, something that's already there, that is already connected to the person. It's just that the bracha is like that trigger that releases it and brings it down here, it helps it manifest into the actuality. And this is the difference between the two opinions. The blessing, the, according to the first opinion, in essence, the blessing was Lavan's blessing. In other words, this was something that was connected to Lavan, that was laying there in the weight, so to speak, for Lavan. And it's just that in the merit of Yaakov, it actually materialized into reality and came down and Lavan was able to appreciate it. And therefore was a hundred. And also now we understand the wording. We say Lavan found in his sheep an excess of a hundred times over. That's the first opinion. However, the second opinion views it that the blessing was totally in the merit and absolutely in the merit of Yaakov. And therefore, we, how does he say it? It was a thousand because Yaakov obviously is connected to a blessing that's above and beyond as we'll see soon in the Sicha. And therefore, he emphasizes, quote, Yaakov brought the blessing. Yaakov is the one who delivered the blessing to Lavan. To understand this a little clearer, will preface with a very interesting phenomenon that we find. That it's brought down that wherever the tzaddikim come to, whenever righteous people come to a certain place, that place becomes blessed. And the question is why? What brings the blessing exactly? And the answer is, because as Rashi says in the beginning of Bereshis, since the entire world was created for Torah and was created for Yisrael, for us, therefore, when a tzaddik comes to a place and through the place, being in that place, he's able to fulfill everything that he has to accomplish. That place becomes fulfilled in its purpose of why it was created, since it was created for that. And therefore, it becomes blessed. And therefore, we can understand now why Lavan was blessed because of Yaakov. Now we understand that Lavan got his blessing because Yaakov was there and fulfilled his mission that he had to fulfill there. Therefore, Lavan became blessed. However, you have the machloikis, the debate in the Zayar is, 
how exactly do we understand this idea that we say that the world was created bishvil hatoyra bishvil yisrael? That the whole purpose of the world is to be here for to serve the needs of Torah and the needs of Bnei Yisrael. See, because there's two ways of looking at it. You can look at it in, the, in a manner where you say the creation and the nations of the world. They're really they're a they're a self-existence. In other words, they are complete, a complete existence and a self-standing one with or without the Torah. But rather, when they help when they contribute to the Yidin, to us doing Torah mitzvahs, then they get an extra importance. Now they have another, so to speak, value, a greater stature. That's one way of looking at it. There's another way of looking at it, however, where you say that the entire creation, all of the nations of the world, their only reason of creation is for, to serve this purpose of helping us to perform Torah mitzvahs. And therefore, when they do contribute to us doing Torah and mitzvahs, when they help us, then their entire purpose of creation, in other words, their entire objective, is met. And now they have a value. To understand this deeper, it's basically along the lines of the machloikas that we said, that we explained, the, the deba- debate where we explained in the introduction, when it comes to machshir and mitzvahs, those things that are not the actual performance of the mitzvah itself, but rather contributing factors, meaning they're used in this prep stages of the mitzvah. Certainly you need them, they're crucial, but they're not the mitzvah itself. And the the debate was, does this push off Shabbos or not? Rabbi Eliezer holds that since you cannot do the mitzvah without this prep, so this prep becomes part of the mitzvah. However, the halacha is that true, you need to have this prep, Indeed, you cannot do without it. You cannot have a sharpened knife without sharpening it. However, it doesn't become part of the actual mitzvah. But still, we do find that there is certain phenomena that where you have something that is not part of the actual mitzvah itself or not part of the obligated part of the mitzvah itself, and yet it becomes a crucial part of the mitzvah. For example, there is a famous Ran in the beginning of the second chapter of Kiddushin where he says over there that a woman receives a great ward, reward for the fact that she assists her husband in his obligation of doing, of performing, that is, the mitzvah of pruvu, of having children. Now there's two ways of looking at it. You can say that she just gets a mitzvah, a mitzvah, a regular mitzvah, of a general one, the fact that she assisted her husband to do his mitzvah. So that's a very nice, kind thing. And that's certainly... A, a, a virtuous thing, and therefore she has a mitzvah. That's one way of looking at it. But there's another way of looking at it, that she actually gets, receives a mitzvah rabba, a great mitzvah, meaning she becomes part of the mitzvah approval. Why? Because without her, it's impossible to do the mitzvah. The only difference is she doesn't have an obligation for whatever it is, it's a separate discussion. So again, the second way of looking at it is that it's not that she just has a, a general mitzvah for being kind, for being so virtuous and helping someone else do their mitzvah, in this case her husband, but rather that she is a crucial implement of the mitzvah and therefore she becomes an essential part of the mitzvah and she has, even though she doesn't have an obligation, she has the reward of this great mitzvah itself, which is one of the greatest mitzvahs. And with this will help us understand the difference between a hundred and a thousand. What is the idea of a hundred? A hundred is the ultimate in anything that's related to nature. We find in various sources that whenever it discusses nature, the highest point is a hundred. For example, in the Mishnah, Perki Yavis, where it gives us the highest amount of years that one lives, it reaches only a hundred. That's all within nature. A thousand is an expression of something that's beyond nature. So that's the highest point. In fact, if you look at the Hebrew word elef, which means a thousand, elef has the same letters as the word pella, which means a wondrous thing, be above and beyond. The nations of the world, meaning the goyim, creation, their shaykhs, their connection, in essence, is only to normal, natural, uh, na- 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 natural order of things which limits itself, as we said, to 100. 
Whereas Bnei Yisrael, Yidin, their shaykhis, their connection to, in their essence of their existence, is to something that's beyond nature, and therefore they reach the highest point of a thousand. Their connection is to a thousand. And this is the difference between the two opinions. According to the first opinion, the nations in the world, and that matter, entire creation, in essence, doesn't really have a connection to the Eden. It's just that when they do contribute to our serving Hashem, to our performance of Torah mitzvahs, then they, be, they get their ultimate blessing as it is limited to their existence. And their existence is only existence of nature and therefore their highest point is they reach a hundred. Whereas the second opinion holds, no. The entire world was created, like we said before, not just as a creation and it contributes to us doing our Torah and mitzvahs, but rather that all the nations of the, of the earth, all of the universe, all of creation, was created because and for Torah and mitzvahs. And therefore, they do have a shaykhis, they do have a connection to the great level, to the maila of Yisrael. And therefore, when they fulfill this, when they fulfill their purpose, therefore they get the same kind of importance as would a yid. And therefore, this gets expressed in the number of a thousand. This becomes the basis for the machlekes between the first opinion, the second opinion, and the zayar. So ultimately, what do we see from this? What is the bottom line? That the world was not just created as a world, and it could help contribute to Torah and to Bnei Yisrael doing the mitzvahs, but rather the entire purpose of Torah and Bnei Yisrael, of, of, the, of the creation was for Torah and Bnei Yisrael. And therefore, when they fulfill their purpose, they don't just get blessed as they would be in their own accord, but rather they get blessed as they are connected to Bnei Yisrael, because now they've connected themselves, and this is really their ultimate purpose, so they have an essential connection to this, and therefore they get a higher degree of blessing, which is a thousand times over, which is what the second opinion said, regarding to what happened to Lavan, as a result of the merit of Yaakov being there. What is the lesson for us? What can we learn from this? That Hashem set up things in such a manner, that what, before Mashiach comes, in other words, while we're in Golos, we are dependent on the Goyim and the nations amongst whom we live and their attitude that they have to us. And of course, to try to get their help and assistance in keeping us safe, in keeping us comfortable and allowing for us to do our Torah mitzvahs. He says, the Rebbe Yid has to always remember that you're not allowed to feel, so to speak, less than. In, in Yiddish, when you need help from a Goy, as if, so to speak, the Goy is doing you a favor. No, on the contrary, you have to look at it that Yid has to know that he, the Yid, is doing really a favor to the guy by allowing the guy now to become elevated and to fulfill his purpose for which he was created. So when the guy helps you, he's not doing you a favor. Essentially, you're doing him a favor by now allowing him, giving him the opportunity to fulfill the purpose of his creation. And through this, the guy becomes blessed just like Lavan himself admitted by Yivarcheni Hashem Bigolecha, that Hashem blessed me because of you, meaning in your merit. I would have not been blessed like this. You, because you're here, because I assisted you, because you allowed you to live here, and so on and so forth, I became blessed. And the Rebbe brings to this also what the Mittler Rebbe explains, that we see this, how this manifests itself, is that wherever most of the Jewish population lives, meaning the greatest number of Jews live, that country usually is the strongest and and the greatest, and they even are more the most fearsome country of all. And we've seen it throughout generations. In fact, in the times of the Mitla Rebbe, you could say that that was Russia. It was one of the greatest uh, em- empires. It was one of the greatest miluchas. However, when that changes, and that shifts, and the Yidin now most of the Yidin, or a great majority of the Jewish population live elsewhere, as is in our times in the United States of America, then that becomes the superpower, that place becomes blessed, and that place becomes elevated in stature as a result of that.